talking to us about this evening. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, as you can see from the picture already displayed, my extended project follows the original, most famous ocean liners of our planet, the RMS Queen Elizabeth II. Inspiration and my first ideas for the project. Originally, I wanted to do a project on just the original RMS Queen Elizabeth and her life. This was triggered from watching the James Bond film, Man of the Golden Gun, about 20 times, and also the Queen Elizabeth's final resting home is also my country of birth, Hong Kong. But then my idea changed. I had a discussion with my supervisor at the time, and we discovered that some sort of autobiographical project wouldn't really get me the marks required for the EPQ. So I decided to base my topic on something a little bit more broader than just one ship on her own. This is what I came up with. The history of transatlantic travel linked to the QE2. And the reason why I chose the QE2 is because she has done this crossing path 806 times. That's more than any other ship before her ever attempted, and no ship um, after her will ever get to that level, because she was in service for 40 years. And I did a quick maths calculation only a few minutes ago. 806 divided the 40 years she was in service means she did 20 crossings a year. From April to August, I started going through big research things. I went through books, this one particular, the QE2's photographic journey, websites, the QE2 story, um, YouTube videos. YouTube videos were a huge contribution to my project. They gave me the key information to my work. And thanks to all these videos here, I learned an awful lot. And also all the interviews I had. This one, for example, was with Carmel Rogers, who was the QE2's last chief librarian and went with her to Dubai on the final voyage. Key source of information. This has been my main source of information ever since I first started getting interested in the QE2. This is the QE2 story forum site. It's a little bit like Facebook, but you can only discuss things about QE2, her predecessors, and her successors. And as you can see here from my suit, I wear the complimentary QE2 pin which supports the QE2 and what she stands for. Final choice of working title and process through the project using the extended project qualification requirements. During the summer, my project of history of transatlantic travel linked to the QE2 was changing. I was becoming more and more interested in just the QE2 on her own and not about her history. So after discussion with a teacher back home, we decided it'd be very good if I based my title around a specific question. And this is what I came up with. How and why did the Queen Elizabeth II evolve through time? And that's what I came up with. When I came back to school, I had to choose a new supervisor because my old one didn't have the time for me. And the first thing we did was change my contents page to a plan page. And that was quite an entertaining day because he told me specifically, you do the contents page at the end of the project, not at the beginning. But there was one advantage. By changing the contents to the plan, I kept the original structure in my mind. I also drew up a Gantt chart, which was a main thing of my project, and which it and which created provisional deadlines for certain pieces of work, and I was able to work to them. Gantt charts are designed to set up targets and deadlines while conducting a project. Unfortunately, I have no photograph of my Gantt chart because I've been through my folder and it seems to have gone missing, so sorry about that. Data logging methods. The EPQ, when I first started learning about it, is ability to test your ability to gather and research reference data. But apart from that, I did something else. I kept a data log diary, and in that diary I have a record of all the official documents I filled out, all the QE2 and QNAR postscripts, past, present and future I've received, every document I've made modifications to, whether I've taken out a reference, put in a reference, put in a picture, taken out a picture, everything, and it shows the dates of all the dates I had the interviews with, with people. And this is what it looks like. So you have the top bit up here, the picture, and then the, your title, even as you can see it's now changed. And this is what it looks like inside. You have the date and what you did on that day. Another main source of information, this is the ocean liner shop Cobwebs in Southampton. This is the only shop in the entire world that specialises in ship memorabilia. I went to visit it back in November, and when I told the owner of the shop that I'd come all the way from Spain, he said, hmm, Spain, I've had people all the way from Australia come and see this shop. <laughs> Final choice of title and combining everything together. Once I had finished all the documents, I realised that the why part of my title I couldn't really find any more information to support it, and, but I had explained a huge part about how and explained it. So, one last time, I changed my title from How do I the Queen Elizabeth II QE2 Evolve Through Time to 
the RMS Queen Elizabeth II, 1967 to 2008, the last of the great transatlantic liners, and how she evolved through time. After I changed the title, everything seemed to make much more sense, and I now had the hard task of combining everything together. Normally, the EPQ process is done as one big whole project. I split it up into sections. The advantages was that when I combined it all together, it was easier to take out information than having to put new information in. The disadvantage was having to synchronise all of the references, the reference numbers, and the setting of each document. And it's harder than you think. Final product and the contents page. Everything was now combined together, and I was now able to redo my contents page. I still had the original structure, but I had to adopt into a new structure that would flow with the rest of the project. Once that was done, I was quite satisfied, and I now had to focus on the task of the final presenting product. This is my contents page. You have the introduction, a little bit about QE2, Cunard of Transatlantic Travel, Cunard of Cruising, for her involvement in the Falklands War, her engine refit, which was the main part of how she evolved through time. She was converted from steam to diesel. Her successors, which are the Queen Mary II, Queen Elizabeth, and Queen Victoria, all of the data references, the appendixes, all the interviews I had, the data references of the books, website, and acknowledgements, and then finally, the pieces of memorabilia and photographs supporting my project. This is my final product. I have the official folder album that's set, that is set off to be going to the examiners, but then I also have my own personal project album, which is set out like this. And I chose these pages as the opening bit, and then this page particularly, because this supports the bit about the QE2's retirement. I now have one YouTube clip video which I'd like to share with you, which supports my project hugely, and was a great help to me during my project. I hope you enjoy. September 1967, a giant known previously as job number 736, gaining a name and making a graceful entrance onto the ocean going stage. At 70,000 tons, the QE2, a second vessel to carry the name, was to become synonymous with luxury afloat the longest serving ship with one of the oldest operating companies. Retirement was already on the horizon, but the Dubai World Company made Cunard an offer they couldn't refuse. That she will be preserved as a historical vessel uh, with her heritage uh, around her. She'll have a museum on board, and so therefore future generations will be able to enjoy the ship and her history. In a year's time, the QE2 will move here to the Palm Development, the world's largest man-made island. The QE2's future echoes her predecessor, Queen Mary, retired in the year the QE2 was launched and still a floating hotel and museum at Long Beach in California. Soon, the mementos from the QE2 on sale at this Southampton curio shop will be rather more valuable. At the moment, she travels the world and she creates a great deal of interest wherever she goes. And she'll be sorely missed around the world. After 800 Atlantic crossings, some might say the QE2's moment came when she sailed for the Falklands as a troop ship 25 years ago. One iconic moment in a long and distinguished life. And if you fancy indulging in a little more nostalgia, you will get the opportunity later this summer. The QE2 is to make a farewell tour of the UK. Amongst the places she'll visit are the city of Newcastle and the River Clyde, where she was launched 40 years ago. Robert Hall, BBC News, Southampton. The last little bit I want to show you is of some surprising, very special news. I published a message on the QE2 forum site saying that I had completed my project, and the first thing I knew, I had two messages flashing at me, inviting me to the River Clyde, where the QE2 was launched nearly 45 years ago for the annual QE2 gathering. Thank you very much for watching me. Does anybody have any questions? First one. First one. One gets real impression that you really know and understand this vessel and its life and its personality. But have you ever seen it or been on it? Neither. I've had to do everything based on photographs, information, talking to people, and just going through the QE2 forum site. But I have seen two of her successors. I saw the Queen Elizabeth in Gibraltar, 
and the Queen Mary II when I visited Southampton. Anything else? What do you think? Sorry, you. What do you think you've, you've mainly got out of this project? Clearly, you're very passionate about it. What do you think it's it's really done for you? The this hardest project? question of all. Well, <laughs> there is one thing in my life in the past. History has always been no, forget it, don't do it. Doing this has given me a huge window into looking into history, and I have really enjoyed it because history, as I've said before, has always been something I've hated. But now, particularly this maritime history of the Cunard Line has been great fun, and it's actually led me into a huge interest in actually working for the Cunard line one day. Ooh. Any other questions? I think that's... Can I, can I ask you one for you, Tom? Of course. Obviously, um, you've found out that she evolved through a period of time and had many roles in her life. Yeah. Was there one in particular that you found particularly interesting or significant? Yes, there is one thing that the QE2 made huge history of. Out of the 25 masters that she had, she is the only one in history and in present day that has been commanded by both a father and son. Commodore William Warwick took command of the QE2 in 1968 when she was first launched, having been a captain on the original Queen Mary, and then his son took command of the QE2, Ron Warwick, in 1990, and then he left the QE2 to become the first master of the Queen Mary II in 2004. Mm. And at those and times, were they both having a similar role? Were they yes, both... they were both the master captain. No, in terms of what the boat was doing. Was the boat Sorry? functioning in the same way? Yes, was... exactly the same way. The only difference that what that did happen was when William Warwick commanded the QE2, she was steam-powered. Mm -hmm. When his son Ron Warwick commanded the QE2, she was diesel-powered. Okay, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? That was lovely, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.